Lighthouse Church presents the following message by Pastor Jason Holloman. Now, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Philemon. Turn to the book of Philemon. Uh, We are going to begin in verse 8. Excuse me, I'm going to read all the way through the entire book. It's important. And then we're going to start looking at the the text itself, beginning in verse 8. And uh, and if you, excuse me, I'm going to move this just a little bit. For those of you that don't know, uh, there is a projector here, and I don't know how it's possible. I assume that it's just uh, just the fact that we're in a wicked world. This projector uh, blows out the hottest scalding air you've ever felt, and somehow the air goes underneath this fancy pulpit straight up my shirt, and I can feel the hot air in my face. So as far away from this I can get, I'm praying to God that this is not the setup in our new building. (laughs) Because I'm going to have to hydrate significantly before I preach. That is not a joke. Yeah, so I'm going to back up just a little bit. um, uh, We made the joke uh, in my family that you can uh, name the book of Philemon a couple of different things. And the funniest one that I heard was filet mignon. (laughs) Oh, man, I almost called it filet mignon, so i got to focus. It's Philemon. A reading of God's word, Philemon, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier in the church and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what I required, what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart I would have gladly to keep him with me, but in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might be by, not be by compulsion, but by your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, but as a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Oh, Paul. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. And at the time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will graciously be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let us pray. Father, would you help us today? You certainly mean what you say here, and that is that we are to receive back, that we are to go to reconcile, and we are to receive those who seek reconciliation. You certainly mean what you say, and your cross is the evidence. Help us. There's so many folks in the room that from the what are we going to have for lunch today to what are we going to eat this week task list to the I can't believe I'm sitting here next to the person that I am. Oh, God, would you do the work that you alone can do for the surgeries that are coming on Tuesday? Oh, God, be merciful. 
For those that are traveling, oh God, be merciful. To those that are not able to join us because of pain, oh God, be merciful. May it be so, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you look here at verse 8, uh, you'll see pretty quickly that Paul walks in pretty significant humility. So Paul's a baller. He's, a, he's an apostle. So he can, he can command a bunch of different things. It's kind of like if the big boss, right, the boss's 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 boss, for those of you that are in big organizations, if they come in and say, hey, have you ever considered, right? And it's like, man, you're not saying it that way. I mean, if, if, if you have the weight of authority, then you have to work really, really hard for it to appear that you really are asking for consideration. That's what Paul's doing. And so Paul, if you look here in verse 9, for love's sake, I appeal to you. Uh, I, an old man, a prisoner for Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I appeal for my child whose father I became. I preferred, if you look down at verse 14, I prefer to do nothing without your consent. Verse 17, me, your partner. Do, do you see the language? And, and I mean, he could just as easily say, do this, please do this. In fact, you get the, you get the, the hint of that as, it, as, as we continue. But you, even in verse 18, charge that to my account. Paul's walking in great humility here, appealing to, oh, appealing to Philemon's love. It's the law of love that he's appealing to here. He can command it, and, and Philemon would do it begrudgingly. But to appeal to his heart, appeal to love, He's hoping that Philemon, as it relates to uh, this slave that has left him, Onesimus, that he would do so in a way that it's his decision. It's rooted in, if he will, birthed from the Spirit. Now, for those of you that, that are not remembering the context, Onesimus stole something, did something. It was very painful for Philemon. And, and this is an important consideration. This is not like 16th to 18th century slavery in the United States. That is not what this is. In the Roman Empire, 25%. Historians move from 10% to 40. So we're just going to cut it in half. 25% of the entirety of the Roman Empire was in for, some form of slavery or bond servitude, which means you put yourself into it. In fact, there is a lot of research. There's a lot of evidence that Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts himself, was a bond servant, put himself into indentured slavery so that he could go be a physician. And so this is very a part of, of the social structure of this current context. This is AD 61, under Roman rule. And this is important because when we think of slavery, we think of 16th to 18th century slavery, antebellum slavery. Antebellum only means just following a war, specifically the Civil War. We think of that term of slavery. That is not what this is. This is 25% of the society with varying social structures. Most of the physicians were slaves. Do you see it? So this is, this is a very different context. And so this very large, very wealthy landowner who had Onesimus under his home did something to hurt him and wounded him bad. We assume that because Onesimus traveled 1,000 miles to go meet Paul in Rome. It's a pretty big deal. And during this time, that would have been very difficult for him to do. And so it's a big enough deal, and we don't know why he went to Paul. We assume because he knew he needed some help. And so he probably went to Paul, Onesimus, went to Paul saying, hey, man, I got a problem. I got a problem with Philemon. Look, and we don't know what the issue was, but whatever the issue was, he probably went to Paul for help. And instead of finding help from Paul for the relationship, he found Jesus Christ, which could not have been a better situation. And so this is the beauty of where we are, but it's important that we see that because when we see this idea of slavery, we don't have the concept typically as Westerners to understand the type of slavery that is being talked about. But you see here Paul's humility. Now, now let's look at Paul's pushing of Philemon. So if you look here at verse 19, to say nothing of you owing even your very own self. What is he talking about? Paul very likely led Philemon to the Lord in his missionary journeys uh, near Colossae. It's very likely. Remember, this letter was probably a companion letter with, um, with the letter to the Colossians, to, for the letter Colossians. So this is very, very likely the case. Remember, if you look at the, the epistles, only, only the first, Galatians, was not written in jail. 
The other three, he was incarcerated. This is the fourth prison letter that we have remaining. And so when he sent these letters, man, this is a thousand miles away. And so it's very likely that Paul led him to the Lord, which means Paul is saying to him what? You owe your eternity for me sharing the gospel with you. Don't you dare not receive back Onesimus. Now, this is important before we get any further. It's a really, I said this last week. Everybody loves the idea of forgiveness. Everybody. Forgiveness is wonderful. It's like a warm blanket. Everybody loves it until you've been really hurt. And if you've been really hurt, man, forgiveness does not feel good. Why? Because we love to hold on to it. Oh, we love it. It feels like, oh, I don't know, like a default setting, doesn't it? You know, you get a computer and it's like, what language do you speak? It's like, oh, uh, you're looking for English or whatever the language is, right? Our default setting is unforgiveness. Unless changed, the factory setting of our lives is unforgiveness. The most natural instinct is unforgiveness. You got to hear that. Unless Jesus Christ changed the heart and moves in a person's life, default is unforgiveness. Like, you don't have to tell, like, do you ever just have to say, now, I really need to demonstrate to our kids to make sure they keep their toys and not share them with other people. No, we have to teach our children to share their toys. Why? Because their default setting is hoarding their own toys. Now, if you think, oh, no, my kid's perfect. You don't know your kid. You just just is what it is. Like, we never have to teach our kids certain things. Man, default setting is in them. Now, Please see the push to say nothing of you owing even me your own self. Now, if you look at the compulsion idea, he doesn't want to put him under compulsion. Go go with me to verse 14. That goodness might be by compulsion, but on your own accord. If you look here at verse 3, the beginning of the letter, grace to you, and peace from God. Why is this an important order? It's a really important order. Unless a person experiences the grace of God, forgiveness is not possible. It's not possible. In fact, to me, it is one of the evidences of a heart that is not yielded to the cross. So if somebody comes in, uh, I hate this guy's guts. Okay, let's talk about that. They did this bad thing to me. Sounds terrible. Okay. Tell me about the cross of Jesus Christ. What does the cross have to do with me forgiving this guy for this thing? It actually has everything to do with it. What you think about the cross has a bearing on how you forgive another. And if you say, I could care less about the cross, you know what I'm gonna do at that moment? You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna stop talking about the cross. Excuse me, I'm gonna stop talking about grace. I'm gonna stop talking about forgiveness. I'm gonna go straight to the cross. Why? Because what am I to do to tell them to stop uh, uh, holding unforgiveness with somebody if they don't know the cross. It's not gonna matter. So, hey, you should really forgive your sister. Why? Because, um, no, because of Jesus Christ and his death and the cross. And so this is why it's so important. So if somebody says, I could care less about the cross, got it. Let's keep your sister off to the side for just a second, can we? Can we talk about something different now? This is why I don't talk about works with somebody who doesn't understand grace. So in verse three, grace to you and peace from God. Is there peace apart from grace? No, there isn't. And listen, if there's anything that's true of today's age, watch somebody just walk around without the, peace, without the mercy and grace of God. There is no peace. I mean, the, the, the amount of work people do just to get to sleep in today's age, just to stay asleep, just to not be anxious is unbelievable. And so, yes, so look at verse three, grace to you and peace from God. Look at verse 14, the goodness might be not by compulsion, but by your own accord. Look at verse 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you'll do more even than I say. And then he finishes it with the last verse, by grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that Philemon has the capacity to receive Onesimus back is because of the cross, 
is because of grace and because he's experienced those things. I am certain that Paul would not have written this letter to a non-Christian. This is important. I am certain that he would not have. He would have written a different letter. He would have written a letter like Romans to a non-Christian. He would not have written a letter like Philemon to a non-Christian. Why? Because the capacity isn't there. It's just not there. Now, we need to talk about this idea of useless. I think it, through different times in history, remember, this was written in 19, not 1961. This was written in AD 61, which is super different, right? I mean, 60, 1961 was great. That's not when this was written, right? And, uh, and I know that it was great because I was born in 77, okay? I remember it well, right? No, we need to talk about this idea of useless. We talk about this idea of useless. This is important. If you look here in verse 11, formerly he was useless to you. And there have been some that have said that this is an indication of demeaning a class of people that are enslaved. And this is a very important point. That is not what is being said here. I'm gonna prove it through the language. The first way I'm gonna prove it is this. Slavery in 61 in Rome had nothing to do with an ethnographic profile, had nothing to do with skin color, had nothing to do with that. In fact, most of the enslaved peoples were orphans, were captured by conquering states, and people being sold into slavery. Had nothing to do with that. And so this is not about a group of people believing the other was more important, but even more so than that, this word, useless, is used one other time in the New Testament. And I want you to see it to understand its context. I'm going to read it first here in Philemon. Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. If you have a Bible and can turn there quickly, turn to Romans chapter 3. I'm going to read it to you if you can't get there quick enough. In verse 12, I'll start in verse 9. Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already changed that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Notice here a very large group of people. What he's saying is everybody's under sin. Let's keep going. None is righteous. No, not one. Not one understands. No one seeks God. For all have turned aside. Notice what it says. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. Same word. The only two times in the New Testament. What's the translation here? He is useless because he's a non-Christian. He is useless because he does not have the spirit within him. And this is the point of Paul, is that you had a bondservant, but now you have a brother. You had a slave, but now you have a son. That's the entire point of the letter. The, the entire point of the letter is, hinges on this idea. He's not saying that slavery is right. He's saying that believing in Christ is superior to all social contexts. It's a critical distinction. And so if you see this, this is this is the gospel. In fact, I, Jeff and I were just talking before the service, and I just love uh, some of the iconic Christmas Eve songs. I just love them. And one of them, uh, Oh Holy Night, I, I wrote the words down because I wanted to make sure that I get the words. But in it, he says, truly he has taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. This was originally written uh, in France, in French. It was translated in English by an abolitionist, by design. This was by design written this way. And in Jesus' name, all oppression shall cease. We sing that. Now, we love the tune, don't we? We love the Christmas trees, the tinsel. We love all of those things. We sing that, and it feels nostalgic. It could not be more theological. I pray and hope that when you sing that coming this Christmas Eve, that when we sing that together, that you will see, and our slave, and the slave is our brother, that you will think, ah, Onesimus and Philemon. That's my hope. That you would think he was useless as a non-believer, and as a believer is Useful for what? Forgiveness, kingdom, advancement of the gospel. Now, 
where do we go? Well, I think there's a couple of applications that we can go immediately here. And I find this to be really helpful because the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son does the same thing. When you read the the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son, it forces us to look at ourselves as one of the roles of those two individuals. The, the, The son who takes half of his inheritance or half of the inheritance due him, and he takes off and squanders it, right? Some of us have been the prodigal. And, and you have to see that as a part of the story. And the second person in the story is the older brother who, right, just sits there and just thinks, you've got to be kidding me. Now, in this room right now, oh, you know where I'm going. Oh, you can feel it. In this room, we've got a ton of prodigals. We do. We have a ton of prodigals. You know what else we have in this room? Tons of older brothers. Oh, you know who you are. Not, not, no part of you stinks, if you know what I mean. No part. No. Everything is roses. Everything in your life, amazing. You know who you are. Well, this letter does the same thing. Onesimus and Philemon force us to see ourselves in those same categories. Why? Because Onesimus left Philemon. Like he left him and probably did him wrong. We don't know what it was. We know he was a non-Christian. We know that he probably sought his freedom, took off, probably took money. And we know that this deeply wounded Philemon, who has his own sin in this. And so there is a person who leaves in sin. And then there's a person who is wounded by that sin. You got an older brother who probably doesn't want to forgive. And you have here a a new Christian who is looking for redemption, who's looking for reconciliation. Now, some of us in here are one or the other, and this is the order that is required. Freedom. So if you're in here and you're holding sin against somebody else, if you are holding debt against somebody else, if you, in your heart, are unforgiving towards somebody that's a debt that you're holding on to. It's tough. It's so tough. I, I literally just had this conversation with a precious sister who was working out some will stuff. And I said to this sister, man, why are you just nickel and diamond all that money? Just forgive it. She's like, why would I forgive it? I was like, because you're the one enslaved to it. Like your kids don't care. They're just doing whatever they want. They're just like, oh man, total freedom. And you're the one hoping that they're going to pay back the transmission from 1986. Just let it go. I can't let it go. Let it go. And, and you know what's going through my head at this point. Let it go. Like, I'm right. I'm like, <laughs> like, just let it go. Like, if I had it on cue, I would have just been like, listen, there's a song I want you to listen to. Is it a worship song? No, it's from Disney. Boom. <laughs> I would have just given her the let it go song. It's important. Why? Because she becomes the debt holder. And for those of us in here, that are holding on to unforgiveness. That is not putting pain upon them. That is putting weight upon ourselves. So freedom here, I wrote it this way. Freedom is through forgiveness. And forgiveness can only be found through the cross of Christ. It's the only way that it happens. It just doesn't work. Why? Because you could say you forgive, but there's no power behind it. Like I can say, oh, I forgive you, but deep down I'm like, hate his guts. There's no power in it. There's no power in it. But if I say I forgive you, why? Because Jesus Christ forgave me and gave me eternal life. What do I care about a $6,735 transmission from 1986? I have eternal life. Like who cares? Now, this is important. Some of you in here, One of you, if not many of you, if not multiple dozen of you are saying, Pastor, it's a lot more painful than a transmission from 1986. To which I say, yeah, I know. Because that's why the father sent his son to die for those things. You don't think he knows? He would have never had to send his son if it was just about transmissions. No, he sent his son because of the depth of the pain of what needs to be forgiven. That's the point. This is why to send his only begotten son was the only possible solution for such 
deep pain. He sees it. He sees it perfectly. Now, if freedom can only be found through forgiveness, and forgiveness is found through the cross, I submit to you that God's word is serious about what it says. God the Father is serious about what he says about forgiveness, and the cross is the evidence. If you think, oh man, he doesn't care that much about that. It's like, oh yeah, he didn't. He did, however, send the second person of the Trinity, his only begotten son, to die on a Roman execution device. It didn't end there. He was resurrected three days later, but was sent to death nonetheless. This is the gospel. The gospel is about freedom and being set free. Now, so for some of us in here, we need to go and be reconciled. We've been the one that's doing the sinning. We're the sinners. I've been this in my life. I've done this. I've been that guy. I am that guy regularly. Listen, those you live with most, you repent to most. So in my life, that's my wife and kids. Sorry, yes, agree. Thank you for saying that. Please forgive me. Like that is the work of the Christian. And then for some of us still, we need to be those that are older brothers. And here's what's interesting. The longer I'm a Christian, the more I feel like I'm starting to become the older brother. Where I look at sinners, I'm like, oh, look at that sinner, right? It's super easy, and I don't know where it comes from. I've been a prodigal my whole life, my whole life, and all of a sudden, in the last 10 years or so, it's like, man, being a, being a snooty, nothing stinks in my life older brother kind of feels nice occasionally. Where does that come from? Man, that's wicked. It's wicked. But let me tell you something. I think the longer that we're Christians, the longer that we're maturing in Christ, the longer that we make good decisions and, and spend time with people who make good decisions, I think the easier it is for us to think that it's easy and not like clinging to the cross. And here's the thing. I don't know which one you are. Depending on the week, I could be both. I could be both. But nonetheless, this is our task. What? What, pastor? What's the task? The task is to be those that seek reconciliation and receive those in reconciliation. I think a question is a natural question. Why don't the band go ahead and come on up? Here's a natural question. Yeah, but what if the sinner who sinned against me, what if they are just laughing and maniacal and ah, ha, 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 and riding off into the sunset and they don't want to be reconciled? That's a great question. I'm not talking about them. God takes care of that. I'm talking about your heart. I'm talking about your heart. Listen, just like the kids with the transmission from 1986, hear me, they're not thinking about their transmission from 1986. No, the person holding the debt is thinking about that. I'm talking about the hearts of those who have not forgiven. Is that you? Is that you? And if it is, ah, oh, there's a weight upon you. There's a weight on you. Yeah, but what if it's still happening? What if it wasn't in 1986, but it's in 2024? That's a harder question. That's a harder question. But the principle remains true, that unforgiveness in your heart is a weight on your shoulders. It was said uh, at one point, and I love the way this is said, unforgiveness is like drinking, I say this quote all the time, unforgiveness is like drinking poison. And as you drink it, you being frustrated that the other person is not getting sick, but that you are the one getting sick. It's a powerful word picture. And then lastly, lastly, forgiveness again can only be found through the cross. And so if that be the case, you first must be under the powerful, amazing cross. If you do not see the cross as sufficient, then don't, don't even think about trying to forgive. First, see the cross as it is. Philemon is the only book that, that Paul does not talk about the, the crucifixion. It's the only book. And some might say, oh my gosh, why is that? Well, it was a personal letter from a guy who discipled and led to the Lord another guy. 
And man, that would have been awesome if it was thunder. Wouldn't that have been amazing? It's the only book. Boom, boom, boom. We can probably figure that out next time. Wouldn't that be good? It's good. It's a good timing, by the way. Good timing. It's the only book that the, uh, it's the only book that, that he doesn't talk about the cross. But what's beautiful about the book is that both of these men now are in the light of the cross. They are in the shadow of the cross. They are considering the cross in this. And so Paul doesn't have to mention it because when he says, not to mention your very life you owe me, man, Philemon looks at it and says, he's talking about the cross. He's talking about the cross. And so he's no longer a guy who hurt me. He's no longer a guy that stole from me. He's no longer a guy that embarrassed me, but he's now a guy who's seeking repentance and is a brother. And what's astounding is this is not just about forgiveness. This is about receiving back. Man, this is even altogether very, very difficult for us. For us. What part of the book of Philemon, whether last week in part one or this week in part two, what part of the book of Philemon registers with you as a future action? Like when you hear it and when you think about it, is there a face that comes to mind? If so, capture the idea. Journal, figure it out. Talk to a dear friend who knows about you and, and, and loves Jesus. Like, think about why is this person's face coming to mind? Or why is this particular circumstance coming to mind? Why do I keep thinking about this thing in my memory or this moment with this person? It's probably the Spirit of God pulling together work for you to walk in greater freedom. He means what he says about forgiveness. God the Father means what he says, and the cross is the evidence. Let us pray. Father, oh God, we ask that your spirit would come. Holy Spirit, come. Move in power. Move in freedom. Would you allow your presence to be for our good? It is true. We ask that you would allow us to do what only you can do. Only you can suspend up from within us a desire even to look at those places, at those moments, at those circumstances. Would you just encounter your people, Holy Spirit, come. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jason. We're going to continue in our service this morning. Through worship, just remembering what Jesus did for us. There's a popular song that says, where would I be if it wasn't for the cross? By the grace of God, there go I. And we can all stand and say that today. Louis Giglio uh, says, you know, someone said to me once that I don't deserve a second chance from the grace of the Lord. He said, next time you say that, remind yourself that you didn't deserve a first chance. It was for Jesus Christ that we could all stand here today as believers in Christ or what he did. And so today we remember what he did for us. First Corinthians, if you want to go ahead and get your elements out and open up the bread side first. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, And he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, let's drink to you. Father, we thank you so much. For your son Jesus that we could stand before you today clothed in his righteousness cleansed from all of our sin from our past 
present, and future sin by the grace of God. It is by the grace of God that we've been saved. It's not a gift. It's not that we earned. It is a gift. It's not that we earned because of what he did for us. He became the ultimate sacrifice, a replacement for us. And so we remember that today. We thank you. We give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. For more information, visit our website at lighthousentx.com.